This is the Naked Genetics Podcast, taking a look inside your genes. Smell is probably our oldest sense, hardwired right into our brains and closely linked to memory. Now researchers are trying to unravel the complex genetics that underpin it. They certainly govern a great deal of our feelings about things, and people are always interested in pheromones and things like that, some thing you can spritz on yourself and you'll become super attractive. Plus, contagious dog genital cancers, gene therapy for blindness, and a rather slimy gene of the month. This is the Naked Genetics podcast for February 2014 with me, Dr. Kat Arney, brought to you in association with the Genetics Society, online at genetics.org.uk. We all know the old joke, my dog's got no nose, how does he smell? Terrible. Cheesy jokes aside, smell is one of the key ways that humans and other animals sense the world around them. Stuart Firestein, professor of biology at Columbia University in New York, explained to me how our sense of smell works and why it's so important to us. So it's quite a remarkable sense to begin with, one that in humans we underestimate. There's generally this idea, I think, that people have less of a sense of smell or less dependence on smell than many other animals that we're not as good at it. Actually, that's not quite true. We're quite good at smell when you test us carefully. The biggest problem with our sense of smell, it turns out, in fact, is that we walk on two legs. So our noses are about five feet up in the air here, and all the good odors are down within a few inches of the ground. That's why dogs put their nose right to the ground when they catch a scent. But you know that we have a very good sense of smell because we use it in the sense of flavor, which is different from taste, sweet, sour, salt, bitter. But everything else is flavor, and that's about 80% olfaction. And that's because when we put food in our mouth and we crush it, we send it up what's called a retronasal pathway, the back of our throat, where it impinges very closely now on the olfactory receptors, which are in our nose. And what do we know about these olfactory receptors? How do they work and and what genes are involved in our sense of smell? Yes, they're quite remarkable as it turns out as well. So first of all, we smell a large number of molecules, hundreds of thousands conceivably. I mean, um, we know of many, many thousands and then there are new smells that pop up every day, you know, like new car smell. I mean, it's a very clear smell, but we clearly haven't evolved something for that, so we we can put blends together. So there are many, many smells. Um, They're all small organic molecules, um, and there are now a large number of receptors. These are these little proteins that sit in the membranes of these sensory neurons that are way up in the top of our nose. Those sensory neurons have these proteins in their membrane that bind bind to these odors, much like a lock and a key mechanism. Uh, and then they, when they bind to this receptor, it uh, depolarizes the cell, we say changes the cell's voltage, electrical characteristic, and that signals the brain that this receptor has located a particular molecule, which is now an odor, and the brain somehow or another interprets that to be a banana or a pear or a pile of dung or whatever it might be that the chemical is coming from. The receptors themselves were first discovered as a large gene family by Linda Buck. And what was remarkable about the discovery that made it worth a Nobel Prize, perhaps, is that it turns out to be an extremely large family of genes, indeed the largest family of genes in our genome. How many are we talking about here? Well, so in in most mammals, we're talking about something in the range of a 1,000 genes. Uh, To put that in some perspective, we now think having sequenced the whole human genome that the typical mammalian genome is maybe 25,000 genes. So now a thousand of them are devoted to your schnozola here, your nose, you know, that's remarkable. That's 2% of your genome, between 2 and 5% of your genome uh, devoted to your nose. So in humans, it's a little bit lower in number. We actually have the 1,000 genes in our genome, but about half of them seem to be what we call pseudogenes, which means they've mutated in such a way that they're no longer probably capable of making a functional protein. And so we get by on, let's say, 500. And the next largest family of these receptors are the ones for serotonin, very important in psychological illnesses and things like that. And in the serotonin family, there are 15 genes. Wow. <laughs> so compared to 500 for odor receptors or a thousand if you're a mouse. 
So what do we know about how cells in the nose choose which odour receptor they're, they're going to go with? How do they choose which one to switch on? Yeah, this is probably the biggest question in the field right now. Uh, it's a remarkable observation that we know, and but we have no idea what the mechanism is. And the observation is that each sensory neuron, you have about 10 million of them in your in this little tissue in the top of your nose, each one of these sensory neurons goes through the genome somehow and picks one of those genes. And all of the proteins that it makes, which are millions of receptors, are made from that one gene. So each cell is devoted to one particular receptor and therefore one set of odors, whatever odors that receptor binds. Not only are they, we say then, monogenic, that they've picked one gene from, let's say, the thousand possible genes that are spread all over the chromosomes. They're located on virtually every chromosome. So somehow or another, this cell has picked one gene. It's remarkable that mistakes don't seem to get made. I mean, a cell really does seem to pick this one gene and express all of its receptors off of that gene for its entire lifetime. What do we know so far about what's controlling that choice and how these decisions are made and how the genes are, are picked and switched on? Almost nothing. Actually, I could say nothing. We could leave the almost out. Uh, there have been many theories. We've tried many things. Many laboratories have tried many things. But we haven't really got a very good handle yet on precisely what it is that was controlling them. It's thought to be probably some feedback mechanism. We do know this. If a cell chooses a pseudogene, one of these genes that's no good, that doesn't make a good protein, it will turn that off and go back and pick another one. And then... Uh, and it will, presumably continue doing that until it finds a gene that makes a good protein and does so. So the thought is, well, it must have something to do with a functional protein and then some feedback that says to the cell, okay, you found a good protein, turn off your gene choice mechanism and stop whatever you're doing. Just make this protein. But we've never found that signal. So the answer really is we don't know. There are lots of ideas, but we still don't know. It's a big question. It seems a very, very mysterious sense. What do you still really want to know about it? Still, there are quite a few mysteries about it, that's true. We don't know really why it has such a strong effect on memory. The wiring in the brain is a little bit, is a bit unusual, I will say, for a sensory system. It doesn't go through a piece of the brain called the thalamus, which all other sensory systems do. We don't know what that means. I'm just stating a simple anatomical curiosity. We have no idea if that's meaningful or not meaningful or anything. The memory business is quite curious. It, I should point out that the memories that are evoked by olfaction always have a strong emotional content. So you remember the first day of school or a first lover, last lover, or something like that, you know. But you, uh, grandmom's house, but it's not like you smell something and remember a page of text or an equation or something useful. Unfortunately, yes, yeah. right. <laughs> that doesn't seem to work. So there are always these emotionally tainted or strongly emotional memories. And we're not quite sure what that means either, but that's an observation that we find with them. They certainly govern a great deal of our um, feelings about things in, in very subtle ways often. I mean, people are always interested in pheromones and things like that. Some thing you can spritz on yourself and you'll become super attractive to. But I will say, for example, that olfaction can have very strong negative effects in interpersonal relations. So you can meet somebody, find them quite attractive physically, then you talk to them and now they're even more attractive intellectually and, and socially and all the rest of that. And then you finally kind of get up close to them, you know, for the first kiss or something and they have some off odor and that's it. Mm, whiffy, yeah. It's over, right? And you'll never yeah. get past that. I don't care how good all the rest of the stuff is, you just won't get past that. So we're very strongly attuned to that sort of thing for sure. That's what you'd like to unravel, the, the scent of a woman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be fabulous, and put it in a bottle. <laughs> that was Professor Stuart Firestein from Columbia University. And now it's time to take a look at the top stories in this month's genetics news with science writer Nell Barry. Hi, Nell. Hello. Now, the first story I wanted to talk about was a really exciting but very small clinical trial of gene therapy for a particular type of blindness. Um, what have the scientists done here? This is really exciting. Yeah, this is really cool, especially because I remember learning about gene therapy back at school many years ago um, and being kind of told, you know, yeah, this is the future in 10 or 15 years. We're going to be treating all kinds of diseases using gene therapy. And as we know now, it's proved a lot more difficult than that for a lot of complicated reasons. 
This is a really small trial with six patients looking at a condition called choroideremia, and it's a type of progressive blindness caused by a fault in a gene called CHM. And what the researchers are actually doing is using a viral vector, so a virus, to introduce a new section of DNA into the eye. And the results seem quite promising. What have they found so far? So, yeah, it does look really exciting. They've actually found that um, people's vision did get better. It's not a kind of immediate, oh, my God, I can suddenly see again. They looked at the acuity, so the kind of acuteness or the clearness of these people's vision, which is what they measure when you're looking at those little lines of text on a sight chart at the opticians. I'm very bad at this because I'm very short-sighted. Um, and they found that that acuity did go up. And also patients were able to see better in the dark. So you're, you're getting some real benefits here. But it's really important just to emphasise that this is a phase one trial. So all they were trying to find out was whether this was a safe way to use this treatment. So it's promising they've got these results, but they need to do bigger studies before they can find out whether this is really going to help. The researchers think that it could help with age-related macular degeneration, which is actually pretty common. That makes about 300,000 people blind every year in the UK. So it's definitely possible that if we can spot these kinds of things earlier on, and if we know that we can treat them at an earlier stage, then it could be a really useful way to stop people from getting to the point where they're starting to lose their vision in the first place, which would be great. Now, regular listeners will know I love my dog genetic stories. And this is a big one. This is a big study published in PLOS Genetics from researchers in the US, Europe and China. And what they've been doing is analysing basically the evolutionary history of dogs and wolves. So they've been doing genome analysis on three grey wolves, one from China, Croatia and Israel, and a whole bunch of domesticated dog breeds. So there's a, a Basenji, which originated in Central Africa, and a Dingo from Australia. And the results are really intriguing. What's what's your take on this? Well, I just want to caveat this by saying I'm a cat person, but, you know, <laughs> dog, dog studies are interesting, sure, sure. What they found was that the, the dog breeds that they sequenced were most closely related to each other. So the dogs were more closely related to each other than they were to any of the wolves, which, not too surprising, given that we know that wolves are quite different and they diverged a long time ago. But what really came out of this, it's, it's almost sort of winding back the clock using these genetic changes to sort of go back in time. And it's actually, surprisingly, or perhaps not, a lot more complicated than we thought because it appears that there may have been different wolf lineages diverging away into starting to evolve into dogs in different places at different times. So there appears to have been a lot more kind of merging and diverging going on than we thought. It's not as simple as saying that we had a population of wolves, dogs started to evolve, and then the two lineages just, just split because there may have been some sort of overlaps at different points in time. One other thing that's interesting and, and exciting, but also actually quite icky, is the story that's come out this month about this contagious dog genital cancer. And this was research from Elizabeth Murchison at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, published in Science. And she's well known for working on the other known transmissible contagious cancer, which is a Tasmanian devil facial tumour, which the devils transfer by biting each other. And now this is a dog genital cancer that can also be transferred. What's she discovered about this? Well, yeah, this is it's kind of horribly fascinating. You know, you get a headline like 11,000 year old genital cancer and you can't help but read on, can you? Ew. So what what they're looking at is it's, it's a tumour, it's a transmissible tumour. So it, it, it arose in one dog we think about 11,000 years ago, and it's been going ever since, which is amazing and a really interesting example of what can happen as cancers evolve. Um, and the researchers have looked at all the genetic mutations within it, and it actually has about 2 million, which is a huge number, compared to a lot of human cancers, which might have around 1,000, maybe up to 5,000 mutations. So I guess really interesting question is, how on earth has it survived with all these mutations causing it to go wrong in all kinds of interesting ways? And they've actually been able to look back and figure out what type of dog it arose in. And they think it was something like an Alaskan Malamute or a Husky, maybe, with a short, straight coat, grey-brown, maybe black colouring. They can't tell if it was a male or a female, though, from, from what they've got at the moment. It is really, really fascinating stuff, a real bit of genetic archaeology. And they're proposing that the, uh, the genetic variations that they're seeing in the tumours from around the world suggest that it started to spread globally about 500 years ago during the dawn of the Age of Exploration. So all these sailors are conquering the new world, uh, taking these dogs with genital tumours with them. Uh, it's not a very nice idea. And now it's time for a roundup of the rest of this month's genetics news. 
Two papers in the journal Nature this month from US researchers have pinpointed new genetic variations linked to the psychiatric disorder schizophrenia, which affects roughly one in every hundred adults. In the first study, scientists compared gene sequences from 2,500 people with schizophrenia and compared them with DNA from the same number of unaffected similar people. Meanwhile, the second study focused on so-called trios, a person with the condition and their unaffected parents, looking for new faults in the affected person that aren't there in their parents. Both studies confirm what's been previously suspected, that schizophrenia is due to a complex combination of variations in many genes and isn't just due to one specific gene fault. This suggests that any two people with the condition may have different genetic signatures. The findings also reveal that most alterations tend to cluster within a few specific biological pathways, such as genes involved in nerve function and brain development, bringing a deeper understanding of the biological processes involved in the illness and opening up avenues for future potential treatments. Writing in the journal PLOS One, Japanese researchers have analysed the genetic information in a whole coral community, including the corals themselves and the algae and microorganisms that live on them. Corals are made up of many hundreds of tiny little animals called polyps, which are glued together with a hard cement. Over time, this skeleton builds up to produce the hard coral reefs you can see in the sea. Focusing on a coral called Porites australiensis, the scientists managed to assemble thousands of genetic sequences from the coral and its passengers, including an algae called Symbiodynum. They discovered that the algae was providing the coral with key amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, which it couldn't make itself. Coral reefs are under threat around the world as a result of human activity and climate change, so understanding more about their genetics and the genes in the organisms that live on them is a crucial piece of efforts to preserve these incredible habitats. If you want to find out more about those stories, the references are on our website. That's nakedscientist.com slash genetics. You're listening to the Naked Genetics podcast with me, Dr. Katani. Coming up later, we'll be finding out how PCR works and getting to grips with our rather slimy gene of the month. But first, it's time to sniff out more about our sense of smell. It's not just mammals like humans and dogs that need to sniff out the world around us. At the University of Manchester, Professor Matthew Cobb and his team are studying how maggots smell things. But what does a maggot need to smell anyway? If you are studying houseflies, then they are probably going to want to smell things like ammonia that are from decaying meat or poo and stuff like that. I study fruit flies, and so kind of the clues in the name, they're interested in decaying fruit. So they're very sensitive to things like uh, alcohols, which are produced by the yeast that's living on the fruit, and to the various compounds you get coming off for both decaying and living fruit. And what do we know so far about how maggots actually do smell things? Well, um, we know in principle the way they, they ha their sense of smell is like ours in that it's got each of their smell cells has got just one kind of receptor on it. We would generally argue that the sense of smell is the oldest sense evolutionarily, so it goes way, way back to when we were just blobs of cells, multi small multicellular organisms swimming around the sea, Organisms would need to be able to detect chemical gradients, to need to be able to uh, orient themselves uh, to detect prey or to detect predators. Now, we know that much, and then it all starts to get very hand-wavy and people aren't quite so sure about how exactly it works. What we do know is that each smell can activate more than one kind of receptor. And there are loads of different smell receptors, aren't there, in, in many species? The reason why we use maggots is they've only got 21. So they've got 21 smell okay. cells. You've got about 4 million smell cells. Maggots got 21. A dog, despite what people think about dogs having a very, very good sense of smell, in terms of the number of cells is very, very similar. The number of kinds of cells is very, very similar. They've got about four, 500. Um, a chicken's got about the same. The question is how sensitive are those cells and how many copies of each kind of cell do you have? My maggots have got just 21, and each of those cells is unique. They're, each one is different. So they've got a very, very low level of organisation. They're not terribly sensitive to uh, the amount of smell. They're very poor at smelling because they've just got one kind of cell uh, that's able to detect each range of odour. So each cell can detect more than one odour, and each odour can be detected by more than one kind of cell. So you've got this complicated 
kind of interaction between a uh, number of cells and number of odors, which means that each odor will produce a specific pattern of activity in the neurons, in the smell cells, and then in the brain, where it actually start, gets turned into perception. How do you go about in the lab testing what your maggots are attracted to, what they can smell, and, and then what you can find out about their smelling system? We've got two ways of doing it. The simple way, which is the way I like, because it's easy, is you get a load of maggots, you put them on a plate of agar, which is like hard jelly, you put the maggots in the middle, you put a smell on one side, you put the lid on, and you wait five minutes, and you see where they've gone, because the maggots are going to wriggle about, and if they like the smell, they'll go towards it, and you can simply count how many are on each side, and you come up with a little index. So that's the, the simple way, simply to watch them. The complicated way, and incredibly delicate way, is to get a, a, an electrode and put it into the maggot's nose. These very, very thin glass electrodes are put inside the maggot's nose, and then you can blow a smell over it and you get an electrical signal which corresponds to what the, that particular cell is doing. And because we're studying Drosophila, the maggots we're looking at are, are Drosophila, which is a geneticist's friend and really helped to establish the science of genetics in the 20th century, um, you can do all sorts of very strange things with them. And so we can make a maggot which has no smell cells at all, no functioning smell cells, and then by using the power of Drosophila genetics, it's relatively easy to allow just one particular kind of the, one of the 21 cells to express all the things that it needs and then to work. So we end up with a system which has got one cell working and 20 other cells that are, they don't respond to any odour at all. So we can then, one, see what the electrophysiological response is, what the neuron is actually doing, and then get some insight into what the brain thinks that means. So, for example, often uh, if you've got a receptor that has got a very broad spectrum, so this is a neuron that can be activated by lots of different odours, if you blow an odour over that receptor, you get a very strong electrical signal. But when you put that maggot onto our little arena and you give it the smell, it's not actually interested, it doesn't do anything. So you're getting a very strong signal in the brain. The brain can see something in inverted commas, but the maggot doesn't show any behavioural response. It must have in its brain, and therefore ultimately in its genes, a pattern of activity that it expects that have meaning. And if we can fool it by giving it something that has no biological meaning, then it well, if it had sh shoulders, it would shrug them and it just potters about. Why do maggots actually need to smell? Because <laughs> you'd, you'd think they'd be, they'd be uh, laid onto like a piece of rotting banana by the fruit fly. Why do they actually need to smell anything? They don't go that far. Right, well, that we don't know. <laughs> Simple answer. Don't know. Uh, the vague explanation we have is, well, what if they fell off? So the, exactly as you say, a maggot is laid as an egg onto a piece of rotting fruit or whatever it lives on. Why would they want to be able to smell, well, what if they fell off the fruit? How would they find their way back? I have no idea if that's actually real. People have, we know that uh, it, maggots that don't have a sense of smell are much less likely to survive, which is kind of obvious. Um, because they can wander off the food and then they can't find their way back. So maybe, I mean, to be more serious, perhaps the reason why a maggot has a sense of smell is that the adult has a sense of smell. So one of the things that we're interested in is whether a fly can remember what it knew when it was a maggot. And there have been a number of kind of contradictory results about this. Uh, it's... Uh, in ecological terms, it's known that many insects will either go on to the food on which they were reared, or in some cases, in the case of parasitoid wasps, will avoid the food upon which they were reared. So there's plenty of evidence that uh, there can be some kind of transfer of information. Where that information is encoded is a, a big debate. Um, it may be in the brain, it may be in the outside of the the pupa that the insect forms before it turns into a, a, an adult insect. But there is certainly a lot of ecological evidence that insects are actually remembering in some way what they knew as a, 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 a maggot. So maybe that's why maggots have a sense of smell, because flies need to have a sense of smell, and they need to be able to recall stuff that they've learnt at an earlier stage. That was Professor Matthew Cobb from the University of Manchester. And now it's time for our question. Listener Randy asks... The polymerase chain reaction. 
How does it work? To answer, here's Dr Sarah Hazel, Senior Science Information Officer at Cancer Research UK. The polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, was dreamed up around about the 1980s, primarily by a scientist called Carrie Mullis. And it's an absolutely fundamental tool to molecular biology. It's basically a way of making lots and lots of copies of short stretches of a specific piece of DNA or RNA, such as a particular gene that you might be interested in, so that you can study it more easily. So to do your um, polymerase chain reaction, your PCR, what you need is, firstly, your target. So you need a bit of DNA that contains the gene that you're interested in. Then you need two things called primers. Now, these are very, very short stretches of DNA that match each end of that gene that you're interested in. And you also need an enzyme called DNA polymerase. Now, that enzyme is found in all living cells, so every cell in your body will have this enzyme. And it's that enzyme that's responsible for copying your DNA when your cells divide. But for PCR, scientists use a very special form of this enzyme. And it comes from bacteria that live in really, really boiling hot thermal vents in the sea. And the reason that they use that particular enzyme will become clear in just a second. So to do the PCR reaction, you mix together your DNA that contains your target your little primers and your polymerase and you also add in the chemicals that the polymerase needs to build up the new chain of DNA. So you put that all together in a very small thin plastic test tube. Then you put it in a machine that's called a thermal cycler. So to start with the mixture is heated up to 95 degrees centigrade so just below boiling point and what that does is separates the two strands of DNA in the double helix. So this is why you need that very special polymerase I mentioned earlier. Normal enzymes just can't handle it at this temperature, but this particular enzyme can handle the heat. So then we cool that reaction down to around about 50 to 65 degrees Celsius, and that temperature just allows those very short primers to stick down to that gene that they match. We then ramp the temperature back up a little bit to 70 degrees, which is the preferred temperature for that DNA polymerase enzyme. So it copies that gene of interest starting from where your primers have stuck down and carries on along the way. Now, importantly, that polymerase will only copy DNA where a primer has matched up. So you can be very sure that you're getting the particular gene that you're interested in. So then the whole thing is heated up again to 95 degrees and we start the whole process all over again. So basically copies get made from copies as well as from the original template. And this very quickly builds up to thousands and thousands of copies over the number of cycles that we repeat this process at. Thanks to Dr Sarah Hazel for that answer. And if you've got any questions about genes, DNA and genetics, just email them to me at genetics at thenakedscientist.com. And now it's time for our gene of the month. It's escargot. Found in fruit flies and named after the French word for snail, but also known as the less exotic flea bag, the protein encoded by the escargot gene is what's known as a transcription factor responsible for turning other genes on and off. It was found back in 1992 and was named because it's very similar to another fruit fly gene called snail. In flies, escargot plays a number of different roles in the growing fly embryo and it's involved in the development of breathing tubes, called trachea, wings, reproductive organs and the nervous system. Amusingly, well, for biologists anyway, the human version of escargot is called slug and it seems to be involved in the development of the brain and limbs. There's also growing evidence that it may be involved in cancer too. And finally, I just wanted to let you know about the Genetic Society's upcoming spring meeting on the 4th of April at the Royal Society in London. It's called Psychiatric Genetics, Pathways and Prospects, and will feature talks from leading scientists from around the world, discussing how genetic research is shedding light on mental illness and improving life for sufferers. To find out more, or to register, head over to the Genetic Society website. That's genetics.org.uk. That's all for now. I'll be back again next month looking at how our DNA gets damaged and repaired and how researchers are exploiting these processes to find more effective treatments for diseases such as cancer. If you've got any questions or feedback, you can email me at genetics at thenakedscientist.com. You can also get in touch through the main Naked Scientist Facebook page, that's nakedscientist.com slash Facebook, or tweet me at Naked Genetics. Every episode of the Naked Genetics podcast is available on iTunes and online at nakedscientist.com slash genetics. The Naked Genetics podcast is brought to you in association with the Genetics Society, online at genetics.org.uk. 
I'll see you next month for another peek inside your dreams.